Hi, everyone. I'm Wes Radies, the Executive Director of Bay Nature. Welcome to today's Bay Nature Talk with Dr. Alejandro Velez about the iconic mating calls of Pacific chorus frogs. Bay Nature is a nonprofit independent media organization devoted to environmental journalism covering the San Francisco Bay Area. We publish the quarterly Bay Nature magazine, plus a weekly email newsletter, social media channels, and a website at baynature.org. Bay Nature Talks are an opportunity to bring our stories to life and to connect you more deeply with experts in the field. Today's talk is a follow-up to our summer 2023 uh, issue cover story titled, Scientists are Decoding the Love Language of Pacific Chorus Frogs. This afternoon, we'll learn more about how frogs use sounds to communicate, as well as the importance of communication in their social lives. We'll hear about several research projects presently being conducted around the area at study sites from Point Reyes to Stanford to Orinda. Before we get started, there's a bit of housekeeping. If you have any technical difficulties, please know that this webinar is being recorded and a link will be sent to you after the event. If you have questions during today's talk, please enter them in the Q&A box that you'll find at the bottom of your screen and we'll answer as many of those questions as possible after the main presentation. We also want to be sure to thank everyone who's contributed $20 to support today's talk. Bay Nature receives 50% of our income from donations, and your gifts make events like this possible. We invite you to donate and to subscribe at baynature.org. Now, it is my great pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Alejandro Velez. Dr. Velez is an assistant professor of biology at San Francisco State University having obtained his PhD from the University of Minnesota and conducted postdoctoral work at Purdue University and at Washington University in St. Louis. In addition to his work on North American frogs, he has studied communication and sensory perception in songbirds, electric fishes, and trop tropical poison dart frogs. Professor, so great to see you. Welcome. Thank you for being with us today, and please take it away. Share a screen. Yeah, that's the screen. Share sound. Perfect. Okay. Apologies for that. Um, but now we are on track. So thank you very much for joining us tonight um, or this afternoon, evening, um, uh, to hear a little bit about the research uh, that we are conducting in my lab. Um, okay. So I always like to start with a general question in evolutionary biology. And in evolutionary biology, one of the main goals is to understand the factors that shape, that generate and maintain this amazing diversity that we see. And, and we often tend to think as biological diversity as all these different species, all the different species that we see in the world. So here we have, for example, six species of frogs. Um, and six different species of birds, including uh, the white crown sparrow, that is very, very common in the uh, in the Bay Area. Now, as an undergraduate student back in Colombia, I took a class in animal behavior, and and that's when I was hooked into studying what I do or in doing what I do. And since then, I've been very interested in understanding the factors that generate and maintain diversity in communication signals. And here what I'm showing you is or are the different sounds that the different species that you saw in the photos produce, right? So these are the communication signals of these different species. And what we have here is what we call a spectrogram. And it's kind of like a photograph of the sound. I'm going to walk you through these uh, figures because we're going to see quite a few um, during the talk today. So on the x-axis here, what we have is time. And then on the y-axis, what we have is the frequency of the sound, which is related to the pitch of the sound. So down here, it's a low frequency sound, would be a low pitch sound. Up here would be a high frequency sound, or like a high pitch sound, OK? And in the, in the colors and in the intensity of the color, what we have is how loud the sound is or the volume of the sound. So we have very simple signals, like this is the, 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 the spring peeper that is very common in the East Coast and in the Midwest. Um, and it's very like, simple tone, it sounds beep, 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 okay? 
And we can start adding a little bit of complexity. Maybe now we have two nodes. And this is the Phoebe song of um, uh, Chickadee. So it's more like Phoebe. And there's a little bit of a change in the pitch from the first note to the second note. Uh, you can add more, a little bit more complex here. This is the Peter Peter song of um, teeth mice, and and we hear some of those in the in the Bay Area. So more like Peter 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 Peter. Um, now, uh, signals like this one here, this is the Cope's great tree frog. And now what we see, okay, let's start by this one. It's kind of like a series of pulses. This is the American toad and it sounds like brr. And it goes forever. It's a very, very long song. Um, and, and we can describe it like as a series of pulses, very short sounds repeated at, at a fast rate, one after the other, brr, okay. Now here we have these, uh, the gray tree frog that has same, like a, a, the similar structure, those pulses, right? But now we see that there are two bands of color, right? So there's sound or energy kind of like here, this is about two kilohertz and then also at a one, one kilohertz sounds something like, okay? And then we have something like really complex, like the uh, um, white crown sparrow song um, in the Bay Area that I'm not even going to try to make it because it's it's very, very complex. But anyways, so I've been talking a lot about the communication signals and how these are different, but what is communication? Like, what do we mean by animal communication? So in a very simple description or definition, animal communication can be defined as an exchange of information from a sender to a receiver in the form of a signal passing through some medium. And it could be a sound, as in this case, it could be visual signal, like the patch here uh, on the red winged blackbird. Um, so it could, it could be in any modality, right? And the type of information that is encoded in the signal can depend, can, can, can be different things. It could be the species identity. What species am I? What's my species? Sex, I'm a male, I'm a female. Body size, I'm a big male, I'm a small male. The fighting ability, physiological condition, and even genetic quality. Um, now, because animal communication mediates very important behaviors, such as mate attraction, those signals are used to attract mates during the breeding season. Those signals are also used to defend territories during the breeding season and outside of the breeding season. So because they're so important in mediating these, these uh, behavioral interactions, we expect natural and sexual selection to favor these signals that maximize the transfer of information from the sender to the receiver, and also to favor these signal processing mechanisms or sensory systems in the receivers that closely match the signal, okay? Now, probably many of you have heard about natural selection and, and Darwin's theory of evolution by natural selection and his seminal book of the, on the origin of species. But Darwin also talked about sexual selection. So in one of the uh, sentences in his, in his origin of species, he dis defines sexual selection. And I really like this quote because in one sentence, he... Um, he clearly explains both natural selection here in red and sexual selection here in blue. So he says this, speaking about sexual selection, this form of selection depends not on the struggle for existence in relation, in relation to other organic beings or to external conditions, natural selection, but on a struggle between the individuals of one sex, generally the males, for the possession of the other sex, generally the females. And, um, he has a little bit of, uh, in his chapter four, he has some sections devoted to sexual selection, but he doesn't go too much in detail about sexual selection in, in the origin of species. He keeps thinking about this problem. So origin was published in 1859, 1860. He's still thinking about this. And he writes in a letter to his colleague, the sight of a fe feather in a peacock's tail, whenever I gaze it, it makes me sick, right? Because he sees this as, problems to his uh, theory of evolution by natural selection. 
He keeps thinking about the problem. And then in 1871, he publishes his second major book, I would say, uh, the, Descent of, the Descent of Man and Selection in Relation to Sex. And that's where he delves into his theory of sexual selection. Um, and he describes two main forms of sexual selection. One is male-male competition in which males actually fight or compete amongst them to get access to females. And the other one is female choice in which females are evaluating different males and choosing some males over other males uh, for reproduction. Okay. And he and others studying uh, sexual selection, whenever or most of the times that we see sexual selection in the form of female choice, what we see is that females tend to choose those males whose communication signal. I hope you're seeing me and apologies, but I don't know what happened, but hopefully we are back in track. So, um, So I was saying, I don't know where I got disconnected, but um, he identified these two forms of sexual selection, male-male competition and female choice. And when, uh, when, when it's the case of female choice, what we see over and over again is that females are preferring these males or the males that produce, that have displays that are louder, longer, faster, more energetically consuming, like those, those traits that require a lot of energy. Okay. So that's uh, a lot about Darwin and natural and sexual selection and not so much about frogs. So how does this communication or animal communication place in frogs? Well, we have over 7,000 species of frogs and most of them have their own species specific mating call, meaning that every species has a different mating call from each other. And frogs and toads are among the most vocal animals. Um, these mating calls are mainly produced during the breeding season, produced only by males. Um, typically, there are some species in the females also produce calls, but in general, the mating calls are produced by males. And they have two main functions. And one is to attract females uh, during the breeding season. And the other one is to maintain spacing between males, to alert other males of their space, whether they're territorial and holding a territory and as the other males, hey, this is my territory, don't get close or uh, kind of like just a personal space in those species that they don't really defend a territory, but they don't like being too close to other males. Um, females use these calls to make uh, uh, mating decisions, right? So they use these calls to tell whether the male is of their own species or not, and whether it's a high quality male, whether it has a good territory or not. So they're basing a lot of their mating decisions on the calls and how the, uh, the males sound. Um, okay, and now our Pacific chorus frogs. So the, the iconic ribbit of our Pacific chorus frogs. And now this is the spectrogram of our ribbit, right? Uh, this is another way in which we look at sound. Uh, it's called the sonogram or the waveform. And this one, we have time on the x-axis and the amplitude or how loud the sound is on the y-axis. As we can see, it, it is uh, it comprises two main regions, right? So there's this part here, but it's also comprised of like short pulses, right? And there, there's a silence. And then there's another section with another series of those pulses, right? And this is how, uh, so this part is gonna be the rip, and this part is gonna be the bit of our call. So rip, bit, rip, bit, or also people talk, um, say it sounds like great, ick, great, ick. Um, anyway, so that silent gap is what generates the difference between a rip, bit, rip, bit, okay? And, uh, and as I was saying, we describe it as a series of pulses. So short elements repeated, these short pulses, one, two, three, four, up to like 10 or 12 pulses in this first phase, and three, four pulses in that second phase. Um, and because it has these two different phases, it, it's commonly known as a diphasic call. 
called by two phases. Well, it turns out that our uh, Pacific chorus frogs have actually two types of calls. And one is called a diphasic, as I would mention it, and there's other than monophasic. And hopefully we can hear, um, we can play here your sound uh, and how they sound. So you're gonna hear a series of one, two, three, four diphasic calls first, and then a series of some monophasic calls. And this is the same male producing these calls. I hope the sound went through okay. Uh, from my end, the monophasic calls were not sounding like I couldn't hear them very well, but I hope you all did. So if you didn't, it sounds like rabbit, 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 and then like or something like that. So uh, with uh, my first undergraduate student in the lab, Adriana Guajardo, she's an amazing undergraduate student, moved on to a PhD program at uh, UCSF. We recorded a bunch of, of males and we recorded both the diphasic and the monophasic calls, and we described these calls. And some of the main findings is like, other than that general structure with silent gaps to diphasic and no silent gap in the monophasic calls, we also showed that these diphasic calls are delivered slower, right? And we can see that here, like these gaps between the calls are a little bit longer than those gaps between the calls and the monophasic calls. We also found that diphasic calls tend to be shorter um, and, the, and the monophasic calls a little bit longer, meaning they have a little extra pulses. So they have like one, two, up to three more pulses added to the call. Um, so that combination between a longer call delivered faster means that these males are putting much more energy and much more effort in producing these monophasic calls than those diphasic calls. So that there's a question, okay, what is really the function of those different calls? Do monophasic and diphasic calls have different functions? Do females prefer one call over the other? And if so, what are like the neural bases for those preferences? And these were the questions that um, uh, Esther, she was first an undergraduate in the lab, and then she joined as a master's student in the lab to start answering these questions. And she's she, she's designing some experiments to try to um, to figure out whether females show preferences for some calls over the others, and what are the neural basis of those preferences. And by neural basis of those preferences, what we mean is like how is the auditory system, how does the ear and upstream of the ear up to the brain, how does it work to make these decisions, right? What, how are these sounds being processed and why would females, what in the uh, auditory system is making females to potentially choose one call over the other? Um, okay, but that is um, talking a lot about the, the signal side, right? The, the sender, the, the, the sender or the signaler, the one that produces the signal and the signal itself. But communication, as we saw at the beginning, involves both the signaler and the receiver, the, the, the animal who is receiving the signal and making decisions based on what they hear. And we talked a little bit about how we expect from natural and sexual selection to be a match, right? So that, that there is a, that we expect a match between the properties of the signal and the properties or, uh, or how the auditory system or the sensory system works. So we asked whether there is a match between the signalers and the receivers. And this is work that uh, Sam Moreno Sandoval, a um, undergraduate student in the lab has been working hard on this and helping me a lot with it. So I'm gonna show you yet another way to look at sound. Apologies for that, but this is what we call the power spectrum or the amplitude spectrum. And here, what I'm showing you is, so remember I said, frequency here on the x-axis, low pitch, high pitch. Now I'm going to bring that axis to, or that y-axis to my x-axis here, horizontal, with low pitch on the left, high pitch or high frequency on the right. And then um, the color, the intensity of the sound, I'm going to put it on the y-axis, okay? So very intense sounds, 
are going to be high on that y-axis and less intense sounds are going to be lower, okay? And now it's kind of like if I would take an average of the whole sound and plot it there. So we see this very strong peak around two kilohertz that corresponds to this band here. And then this lower peak here at around one kilohertz that corresponds to this band. Um, and then we see another weaker, like around three kilohertz or so, that will be this one. Okay, so the question is, is the auditory system tuned to the frequencies of the call? Okay, and to answer that question, we measured hearing sensitivity uh, using the auditory brainstem response, and this is a technique typically used with newborn babies to check their hearing. Okay, um, many of you probably had as an adult also uh, had an ABR or an auditory brainstem response to check your hearing. And this, uh, how the ABR works is we play short tones, short sounds of different frequencies. In this case, we did from 400 hertz, low frequency up to five kilohertz. And these short tones at very different levels from very high 85 decibels, which is pretty loud, down to 40 decibels, okay? And what we see, what we record with those electrodes that are just placed on the scalp we can record the uh, the response of the auditory brainstem or, or the auditory system. It typically picks signals, picks up signals from uh, from the auditory nerve and uh, the auditory brainstem, and maybe a little bit of the memory. But what we see here is that in response to a tone that is very loud, 85 dB, we see a very strong response, right? So this waves, that's what we call the ADR. And as we start lowering the volume or the intensity of the sound, that response starts getting weaker and weaker and weaker and weaker up to a point that we no longer see a response from the auditory brainstem or we don't see an auditory brainstem response. So we call that that minimum level necessary to elicit that response, we call it the ABR threshold, okay? Now, if you think about it, right, in this case, lower is better, right? Lower, a lower value means that the auditory system, that the ear is very, very sensitive, sensitive to that particular frequency, okay? So we did this with our frogs and uh, here's what we found. We found that um, our frogs are very sensitive, low is better, low is very sensitive, very sensitive, at frequencies around two kilohertz and three kilohertz, between two and three kilohertz. And this is combined for both males and females, males in blue, females in red. Um, but interestingly, we find that uh, they have a second region of like enhanced sensitivity here at lower frequencies between 400 and 600 hertz. Now this shape, um, of the audiogram. This is what we call the audiograms. And again, probably some of you have the audiogram generated where they ask like, hey, do you hear the sound? Yes or no? And then they say like how sensitive you are to lower and higher frequencies. That is the audiogram. So typically our audiograms, our audiograms is more like a U shape, right? Uh, where we're very sensitive at intermediate frequencies and not so much at higher and lower frequencies. But frogs tend to have this kind of more like a W shape audiogram, okay? And that's because frogs are different than us. Uh, so we have one uh, sensory organ, one auditory organ, that snail-shaped uh, cochlea. We have one, right? We're one on each ear. Frogs have two, two separate organs. One that's called the amphibian papilla, and it's very sensitive to lower frequencies. And another one called basilar papilla, that it's sensitive to higher frequencies. So we expected this W-shaped um, audiogram in our frogs, but again, the question is, is there a match, right? And um, when we overlay that spectrum of the call with our audiograms, what we see is that, yes, the frogs are very sensitive around 2 and 2.5 kilohertz that match very well that strong peak in their call at around 2 kilohertz, but that not so much here at the one kilohertz. So this second um, spectral peak or the second 
region of energy in the call is kind of like right where where the two organs match and where the frogs are not that sensitive to sound. And that is a little bit, sort of, well, it's, it's surprising because typically what we see in other frogs is that the two peaks match very well with the two different organs, right? Um, so that's kind of surprising. We did some, we, we're running some analysis or we ran some analysis on like individual variation and how, how can that affect that match between the signal, the signal and the receiver? And what we're finding is that bigger females, so what we're finding is that the size of the of the of the animal affects how they hear the shape of that of that that, that W shape, that audiogram is affected by the size, and that in turn affects how there is this match between the signal and the receiver. So I'm not getting into too much detail of that, but it's, but it's, uh, it's promising and exciting. Okay, I'm gonna change or go back a little bit to what we were talking about, um, Darwin's sexual selection and how females tend to prefer louder, longer, faster. And then there is a big question. So if females are choosy and they're always choosing for the louder, the longer, and the faster, how is variation maintained? How do we see some peacocks with very nice feathers and some others with not so much, right? How do we see, why do we see males, some of our frogs that call make very long calls and very rapidly, and some frogs that don't make those or, or make shorter, slower calls? How is that variation maintained? And um, William Hamilton and Marlene Suk came up with a hypothesis aptly known as the hamilton Suk hypothesis. And they proposed that uh, health and resistance to parasites are indicators of good condition for the males, okay? And that the preferred traits by the females are very costly to produce. And then that healthy males in good condition can produce those cost, costly preferred traits. Um, so one of my graduate students, Julia Messersmith, together with Esther when she was an undergrad in the lab, uh, wanted to tackle this question. And they asked her, so how does, oh, I tackle this question with our Pacific chorus frogs and the fungal parasite, uh, BD, or this chytrid fungus, um, Baytrichid, I, I always mess up the name, Batria coquitrium dendrobatides, BD. It's a, uh, it's a chytrid fungus that it's infecting frogs all over the world. And it's, it's one of the causes of, of uh, amphibian extinction. So they ask whether BD infection influences male calling behavior. And if so, whether females prefer calls of uninfected males. So based on Hamilton and Suk, we tested three specific uh, predictions of that hypothesis. So one is that these sexually selected traits are honest signals of parasite resistance. So in our system of Pacific chorus frogs and BD, we uh, predicted a correlation between infection load or infection status and the call properties. Based on Hamilton and Suk, uh, Hamilton and Suk proposed that costly energy dependent traits will be more affected than those that are less costly traits. So remember that difference between diphasic and monophasic. So they predicted that there would be stronger effects of BD infection on these monophasic calls because they tend to be more energetically costly. And then finally, that females prefer less infected males based on the showy traits. We predict that females would prefer the calls typical of less infected males. So they went, recorded a bunch of calls, and then they took samples of their skin to measure whether they are infected and how badly infected they were. Now, the sad thing is that during that year, uh, 41 males were recorded <laughs> in Orinda, in the East Bay, all of them were infected by BD. All of the frogs that were recorded that, that year were infected by BD. And some of them have very low, so here in the x-axis we have like the infection load, low load and highly infected on the right, on the right side of the axis. 
So there was a big range of infection, but all of them were infected. And so what we find, or what, what Julia found, is that there is an effect of infection load. So those males that are heavily infected produce shorter calls, shorter calls. And that effect is stronger in um, those monophasic calls that are more energetically costly. Now, there could be two different ways that the call is shorter. One is that they make less pulses, right? Like they cut it short. Or because it's a train of pulses, right? It's like a brrr rip it, or in this case, it's like rrr. they can make, they can produce those pulses, the same number of pulses, but faster, like rrr, like very fast, rrr, right? And that's what she found, right? So pretty much they're not changing the number of pulses or elements that are in the call, but they're just producing them faster. Um, so we brought females to the lab, and in the lab, we have a setup in which we can uh, bring females in a very controlled environment, in a kind of like a soundproof room, we have a test arena with some speakers um, where we can play back sounds, either natural or synthetic, to ask females, hey, which one of these calls do you prefer? And we have another speaker on the, on the, uh, on the roof um, if we need to play some noise or whatever. And we have a camera, an overhead camera, where we can see the behavior or what's going on. So here it's like you're looking down from that camera and we have two different speakers, one here and two here, kind of like these two speakers. And here in the center, we have a cup. And right there is our female frog. And what are you going to see? You're first going to hear the calls alternating from the two different speakers. And then hopefully what we'll see is the female kind of the choosing one of those calls. There's the movement of the female. And there she goes. So uh, yeah, we spend a lot of time looking at these type of videos and in real action and also their allies. But anyway, so we were playing back calls typical of a, a highly infected male and calls typical of a male that is not highly infected. We're asking us, hey, do you care? Do you check and tell the difference or do you prefer one call over the other? And the answer is not really. Out of the 15 females, eight chose one and seven chose the other. So there is no really a strong preference here. So we are now the first group to look at how infection by duty affects called properties back. I think this is from 2010 or so. Several papers came up going to the field, measuring, recording the calls, um, getting samples of their skin, swabbing frogs, and testing for BD. And a lot of studies have found uh, correlations, right, between BD infection and uh, different properties of the calls. Now, all or most of these papers, they find this correlation between property, uh, between the signals uh, and BD infection, and they tend to make big claims about how this will affect sexual selection and, and, and mating preferences and so on. So what I like to tell my students about this and the public in general is like, we can't really assume that differences in the signals have implications on how receivers are gonna react to that, right? They might not care about what's going on, right? And then because of that, I also tell my students, well, you have to read very critically. <laughs> And don't uh, believe everything you read in these papers. And when you're writing your own papers, you have to discuss with caution, right? It's really good to propose implications and what could happen, but be very careful of where you go with that. Okay. Um, I'm going to change uh, gears a little bit here. I'm going to talk about a little bit of variation among populations, okay? So we're talking a little bit about variation in the signals, and that would be within a population between males like individual variation. Now we're going to talk a little bit about variation among populations and in the specific case of urban noise. So say it's, it's been, yeah. So urban noise or anthropogenic noise has been become, has become like a very, very important topic, both for behavioral ecologists, evolutionary biologists, but also conservation. So yeah, apologies for that. I lost power for a minute and everything got 
Anyways, um, so let's see. Yep, okay. So um, we're talking about variation among populations, urban noise, and um, probably you saw in the news after COVID. So there, there, there is, there was a Bay Nature uh, article a few years ago on how the um, the white pond sparrows are shifting their song based on uh, whether there's a lot of anthropogenic or human generated noise or not. And then the same authors, Elizabeth Berry Berry and David Luther, they came back. It was pretty awesome because they came back during COVID-19, during the pandemic, the recorded birds from the same populations and they show that when there is not much noise, then they go back to, um, to uh, uh, producing the songs as if they were not so much noise. So it's a pretty cool paper. Uh, it received a lot of attention and it's very local. It's in the Bay Area. Uh, so it's very interesting. Now, a lot of has been done about, or, or we're starting to look and learn a lot about how the signals change. And uh, the same authors, uh, Liz Derryberry and Dave Luther, they, in 2021, they published this paper of what is known and not known about acoustic communication in an urban uh, soundscape. So in a nutshell, what we know is uh, that this human generated noise is, it, it, it's biased towards the lower frequencies. So again, we have the power spectrum, low frequencies on the left, high frequencies on the right, and then the level or the volume of the sound on the y-axis. And then city noise here in this black line compared to forest noise is much higher at these lower frequencies, okay? So that is typically the description of the, of the human generated noise or the urban noise. Um, and then also what we know is that in these urban soundscapes, the signals tend to be, when there is a change in the signal, the signals tend to be louder, right, or longer, right? And this makes sense, right? When you think when you're in a bar or a very loud place, cocktail party, when there's a band and a lot of people talking and someone says, asks you something like, hey, do you want to drink? And you couldn't hear, so you say, what? So you, 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 you talk louder and you make that vowel longer, right? To try to get that, that, that message across. So louder, longer, repeat it at a faster rate. Like, what? What are you saying? What? Right? And in response to this low frequency noise, we also see that the signals tend to shift to higher frequencies and trying to escape that uh, effect of that low frequency noise. Okay, so that's kind of like what we know. Now, what we not know, and uh, what they describe in this paper is the greatest gap in knowledge in the field is understanding how receivers may be adjusting or evolving in terms of their sensory capabilities and thresholds in noise. Well, while they were publishing that, we were starting, the, we were starting to tackle this question, and this is... Um, so here are here they are, Tara and Carolyn, who you've read a lot about in the Bay Nature um, article. So we started this project on kind of like the name towards a complete picture of communication and anthropogenic noise, auditory processing among urban and rural soundscapes. And both Tara and Carolyn are like spearheading this, this, this project. And uh, some amazing undergraduate students, Ada, Dominic, and Annie, have been very helpful with, with a lot of data analysis, data collection, and so forth. So we've identified several populations in the Bay Area with different levels of both natural and anthropogenic noise. And in this project, we have four main uh, aims, and luckily we got uh, funding from the National Science Foundation to pursue this project. And the, the aims are to look at the soundscapes, right? To really characterize those soundscapes and the communication signals with our frogs to see if there, there is some sound or, or some, some of the populations are like well within the city, right in the Presidio, right by the airport, right? Some other populations are more are rural here in Orinda, California, in the East Bay, Point Reyes. And then some of the other populations are closer to the ocean, right? Uh, here, the uh, Mori Point, 
a point radius close to the ocean and also here in the Golden Gate uh, recreational area. So we want to characterize those soundscapes, get a better description of just like, oh, no, yeah, it's low frequency noise, right? But how does it change during the day? How does it change during the night, right? Uh, how does it change with the seasons? Uh, we're also asking whether the signals of our frogs, whether the mating calls are changing, and that's a lot of work that um, Tara is doing. Uh, we're also focused on how hearing abilities may vary among these different soundscapes. Uh, that would be the physiology part. Um, how variation in hearing relates to communication. That would be behavior, conducting these behavioral experiments like the video that you saw. And uh, we're starting to find some differences, some variation. How does that relate to the inner ear? What are the mechanisms or what is the anatomy that could be uh, correlated with these differences in hearing? So today I'm gonna show you a little bit of some very preliminary data from three populations. Um, one here that we kind of like describe as more uh, rural and less noisy area. Another one in the Presidio of San Francisco, more of a noisy area with human generated noise. And here at Maury Point where there is um, some noise from the ocean, but also some noise from the highway, not to close highway, but, but there is like a combination of both uh, ocean noise mainly and a little bit of human generated noise. And I'm gonna show you only the results from uh, preliminary results from the hearing abilities because it's what I find more interesting and what is the big gap in knowledge, right? And so again, remember in these audiograms, what we show is like lower is better, right? So remember that lower is better. So these are the audiograms for frogs from these three different uh, populations, one very close to or in the city, and then one like close to surf noise, and one more like a rural area. And what we see is that in the city, these thresholds are higher, right? And remember that lower is better. So uh, it could be thought as of some sort of like hearing loss, right? However, it's not that much like uh, an audiologist will say, well, that's not a big difference to be considered hearing loss. And I agree, like it, there's a difference of a few decibels, but it's not like severe hearing loss. However, when we do this, this is generating these audiograms in quiet, in silence. When we're playing back noise, what we see is that they have very similar hearing abilities. There's not that much difference over here between the populations in the city and the population, the other populations. So one explanation for this is that these uh, shifts in the audiogram or in the threshold could be acting as like lowering the gain to filter out some unwanted noise, right? Again, these are very preliminary results. You're very excited about them, but um, stay tuned for when we have the analysis from all the different populations and we can correlate this better with um, the characteristics of the background noise. Okay, and very quickly, because I know we're running out of time due to my uh, connection, I want to talk a little bit about an, a last project that we're working on in variation among potential species. So, it is unclear whether Pacific chorus frogs include three or one species. Some authors divide the group into three, Hyliola regilla in the north, uh, Hyliola sierra mainly in all California and the sierras, and then Hyliola hypochondriaca in the south. Okay. Um, however, some other uh, authors do not recognize these three different species. And they say that their results do not support the species designation. Um, and they suggest that further geographic sampling that incorporates behavioral data, it's very important for the taxonomy. So I come from a behavioral ecology background, studying animal communication, studying frogs, knowing how the call is so important in frogs to tell apart one species from the other. So I thought as soon as I moved to California, well, what a best way to go and uh, travel around California and go to these all amazing places and get some recordings. So uh, we've been sampling different populations from down from San Diego up to Humboldt. And we've been recording the frogs and getting some uh, tissue samples. Javier Placencia, a master's student, took upon this project. I wanted to make a big thing asking how do ecological selection, sexual selection, and genetic drift interact to promote population divergence. Now, he moved on to a PhD program, very proud of him. Uh, however, he didn't finish the work. So uh, 
three amazing undergraduate students, Chariya, JW, and Sam again, kind of like picked up where he was, um, where he left. And I'm gonna show you only uh, about the calls, some results about the calls. And what we find is that now here, it's the same color code from north on the left to south on the right. What we see is that when we count these pulses, if I make you like squint your eyes a little bit, um, you might, I might be able to convince you that maybe these frogs here in greener are producing a little bit more pulses than these. However, when we look at how fast these pulses are produced, that pulse repetition rate, it's pretty cool. Like these two, four, five populations in the north have a faster pulse rate, and these populations here in the south have a very slow pulse rate compared to those others, right? So that means these frogs up here are calling more like ribbit, and these frogs down here are calling more like ribbit, 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 kind of like that. That's a little bit of an exaggeration, but that is the sense. And why are we so excited about it? Well, these two properties of the of the calls, the, the pulse repetition rate and the and the duration are typically very important for species recognition in other chorus frogs, in other hylids, other tree frogs, and these are some Australian frogs, and even in our frogs. Back in the in seventy five, they suggested that the the property the the difference between the calls that females might be using to separate. Hyliola regilla or, or Pacific chorus frogs with the California frog, Sudacus calaverina, is that pulse repetition rate. So we're very excited about these preliminary results. And what we want to move forward is asking, like, hey, what are the implications for mating behavior? Do females prefer calls from their own kind of like lineage that this lineage of the what it would be the Sierra, Hyliola Sierra? compared to the hyola hypochondriaca, how strong are those prefer preferences, and what are the properties that are used to recognize one lineage over the other. Um, I'm also very interested in how the auditory system works. So if we find those preferences, what are the, again, the neural bases from um, uh, behind those preferences? And very quickly, because it's the pulse number, how many pulses and how fast they're delivered, I have a hunch that these pretty cool neurons that were discovered in these frogs back in the early 2000s, that they count pulses and they're very sensitive to how fast those pulses are delivered. So we can start asking whether these neurons are tuned to different rates of repetition, to different number of pulses that they need to count to fire. And then we can ask how, how these tuning properties arise and how the neural circuits evolve. So with that, I hope that I, with all the glitches and stuff, I hope I've convinced you of how interesting these frogs are. And now every spring, late winter, early spring, after some rains, when you start hearing the ribbits, ribbits, ribbits around the Bay Area, you can start thinking about all these pretty cool work that my students are doing at San Francisco State. And uh, with that, I would really like to thank um, all the lab members, all the members in my lab and students, and masters and undergrads, colleagues, bands, Breedenburg was influenced by like, very important for oral work with VD. Colleen has been amazing with all the uh, genetic analysis for the populations. And of course, all the managers and directors of the different field stations and the, the different the, the, our different field sites, funding from our students coming from different um, entities, and then the National Science Foundation and C Super for funding and my research. And of course, you, thank you so much for joining. And I'm sorry it went a little bit long with the difficulties, but thank you. <laughs> Professor Velez, thank you so much for that fascinating presentation, and thank you for fighting through the technical difficulties. You didn't let it phase you at all, and we really, uh, we really appreciate it. I, for one, learned quite a bit from from your remarks. I, the idea of these frogs uh, making them working to make themselves heard in the crowded bar of the uh, of the Bay Area is a, is an idea that is going to stay with me uh, for a long time, uh, as long as as well as perhaps the idea that our, our frogs in the south are a little bit more laid back in their calls. Uh, 
um, similar to uh, similar how we might think about Northern and Southern Californians as well. Exactly. <laughs> so I want to let everyone on the line know we're, we have a few minutes here at the end of the presentation for audience uh, Q&A. I see we already have had uh, a few questions uh, submitted. And if you are out there in the audience today with a question that you'd like to pose to uh, Professor Velez, uh, please drop it into the Q&A at the bottom of your screen. Uh, and we'll get those queued up and, uh, and posed. Uh, the first question that we'd like to ask uh, is for all of the citizen, citizen scientists, citizen naturalists uh, in the audience this afternoon. Uh, Professor, can you uh, give us an idea of the types of conditions out in the field, out in the local area that are most conducive uh, to folks on the line hearing these calls uh, for themselves? Yeah, like, so when are we most likely to hear these frogs calling? Yeah, yeah. Uh, so around the Bay Area, they kind of like start breeding. It depends on the rains, right? And we know how <laughs> variable the rains have been the last few years, right? And how we go from a drought to a very wet year. But typically, we start hearing them like late October and November with the rains. Um, and really, after a good rain in late November, we can start hearing a lot of these frogs. If there is like, we need these ponds to fill up with water. They breed in very seasonal ponds. So if you live by, if you live by the Presidio, like Maury Point, keep an eye out when you're hiking, whether these ponds are filling up with water. And once they're filling up with water and after a good rain, they'll start calling. Um, then a little bit later in the season, it's more like they like uh, hot and humid. So a warm day after a rain and the warm Bay Area is not like, well, depending on where in the Bay Area, but here in San Francisco is not that warm. But uh, but those like warm, humid nights are what they really like. Uh, and that's when we hear most of the activity. Terrific. So we have a question from Julie here about the infection uh, that you were tracking out in the field and the, the variation in the levels of infection and in the frogs mm -hmm. that you were tracking. Uh, a question is, there, are, there any, uh, are there any treatments uh, for that type of infection? What is it that actually moderates the viral load? Yeah, so that, that's a great question. And uh, from my side, I'm not the expert on BD infection, but I, I've learned a little bit <laughs> from working with it. And the, the very interesting thing is that these particular frogs are very resistant to it. There is something with these frogs that they can tolerate really high loads of the fungus and not and not die and not like present any like uh, symptoms of being infected. Um, so that is that is that is very interesting. And there's some research going on in, in at SF State with Vance and I think other folks in in the Bay Area looking at what is it that these frogs have that make them so resistant to to the fungus. Um, they are considered to be kind of like a, um, uh, uh, a species that can like can tolerate a lot of uh, high loads and transport it to different sites, right? Uh, we have also in the Bay Area red-legged frogs. They're not as tolerant and it can be a problem for, for these frogs. So um, people are looking at the skin microbiome to see if there's anything on their skin that makes them uh, resistant to these frogs, but but to to this um, to the fungus, I mean. But but uh, yeah, that's the best I can offer right now because I'm not the expert on that end, and uh, we're still learning a lot, <laughs> trying to figure out how how do they keep well and what is different from those that keep low levels and those that keep high levels of, of fungus. Yeah. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, the next question I see here comes from Ronald. Uh, Ronald is interested to know. Uh, do the calls that you observe vary with environmental conditions, such oh. as temperature and yes. humidity? Yes, that is a great question. So yes, the calls vary mainly with temperature. So frogs are what we know as cold-blooded animals, right? So when it's cold, they're much slower. <laughs> and then those calls are, the calls are also much slower when they're cold. And, and those differences that I showed between the southern frogs and the northern frogs, uh, they're all temperature corrected, right? So it's like if the call, if the frogs were calling at the same temperature, how would they sound? Okay. So yes, so so temperature has a strong effect on how fast they produce the calls. Uh, 
how, yeah, mainly on how fast and how long are the calls. The body size has also um, affects how the call sounds. And typically bigger males uh, have lower pitch calls and smaller males have higher pitch calls. And you can think about it as like a violin, a small violin, and then a big uh, bass or viola bass. So the bigger the uh, sound producing structure, the, 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 the lower the pitch of the sound. Wonderful, thank you. We're gonna finish with three questions that are about different dimensions of your work and your research itself. Uh, the first comes from someone who sounds uh, like, a, like a student or a young person. Um, interested to know, from your perspective as a behavioral ecologist, what advice would you have for someone interested in making a career in wildlife or biodiversity conservation? Yeah, well, that, it, it's great to hear that there are people there interested in doing this. I think there is a lot, like, uh, there's growing interest in how, well, with, one with climate change, right, but also with urbanization, the, the, the sprawl of these cities, and we're fragmenting these populations, like how is that affecting both genetic, like uh, the uh, connectivity between the different populations, and with that, how is behavior changing as, as we're studying? So I think in the future, there's gonna be a lot into that and, um, and a, a lot also into managing these very fragmented populations. Uh, so definitely pursue uh, what I say is do what you feel passionate about, right? I, since I was an undergrad, I felt very passionate about animal communication and that's, that's what led me here. And so if, if you feel like this is your passion, pursue it, that, that there, is, there is a need to, to better understand both evolution, animal behavior, and what, um, how are we affecting uh, the environment and how are we uh, affecting the evolution of these different different animals and species. Perfect. Thank you. That's great advice. Next question, second to last, uh, is about tools of the trade. I'm curious when you're out in the field uh, conducting your research, um, what uh, what equipment are you using to capture the uh, capture the calls? And then what audio software are you using to process the process the info the auditory information mm -hmm. once you get it back to the lab? Yeah. Oh yeah, that's a very interesting question. So um, we we have two kind of like systems for the sounds. One are some automated recordings. Uh, they're called song meters and they're produced by wildlife acoustics. And those we deploy. We deploy, we put them there and they record. But those we're most interested in getting like overall activity of the frogs, the noise in the environment. Those are the ones that we're using to record like all this noise. Um, so yeah, so it's wildlife acoustics, uh, the song meters. And now, and, and for recording particular calls, we have like handheld recorders and we have two types. One is the Tascams and the other ones are the uh, Moran, so the, the, the two brands. And we use microphones, typically for recording males, we use microphones that are very directional. Uh, so meaning like they will, they will record pretty much what's in front of them, also what's behind, but not so much what's on the side so that we can like, okay, focus on that vocal male, right? And catch that call from that male. And then in the lab, we use a combination of, um, we use Audition a little bit, we use, or Adobe Audition, kind of like to find the places where we can start analyzing, but not so much for analysis. We use uh, Raven is a software developed by the Cornell, uh, uh, the Bioacoustics Lab in Cornell. So they developed this software. It's very, very popular for analyzing animal sounds. We also use R uh, to do some things to make more automated uh, measurements. And we also use MATLAB. So there's a combination of different things. Depending on what we need to measure, we use different software. So, so that's another thing. Another advice I gave, like, yes, we can go into the field of uh, conservation biology, wildlife management, but always getting some um, coding and computing skills are very, very helpful. <laughs> Seems to be a common theme. Yes. We'll wrap up this <laughs> afternoon with uh, one last question that's forward looking. Uh, how can interested listeners uh, and viewers today stay in touch with you and the progress of your work? Yes, so I will, 
I will update my website. <laughs> and uh, in my website, well, there is a link to reach out to my website, through my email. Uh, there is a contact. Um, so definitely reach out. Um, you can find me at SF State. Um, I have to say, I recently transitioned. I'm now working at uh, University of Tennessee in Knoxville. So there's going to be a little bit of change in the website, uh, but I'll be back in the Bay Area doing some more research with the frogs. And I hope that many of you join Tara and Carolyn in, uh, I think it's going to be like December or so, to go out to the field and try to listen to these frogs and maybe get some recordings. Outstanding. That is a great note to uh, end on. We share that enthusiasm. Uh, and with that, we're going to uh, conclude for this afternoon. Thank you again, Dr. Velez, for sharing your expertise with the Bay Nature community. We really appreciate it. Uh, and we look forward to keeping our ears open for frog calls and getting out with your students into the field later this year. So thanks so much for being with us this afternoon. Awesome. Thank you so much for having me. It was fun. I, I, I'm sorry about all the technical difficulties, but uh, I, I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. So thank you. So everyone, that concludes our Bay Nature Talk for the afternoon. We want to thank you again for attending this afternoon, for donating to support. Uh, in the coming days, you'll get an email from us with a link to the recording for you to share, and in case there was anything uh, you'd like to see again or review. Thank you again. Have a great afternoon, and we'll look forward to seeing you next time.